Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to yet another Horus Heresy Law Breakdown. We are now on book number five, Fulgrim, where we're going to get quite a lot of interesting information. This is the first book that isn't basically focused on Horus and his various bullshit misdeeds. And of course, focused on the Emperor's children. There's quite a lot of interesting little tidbits in here. For example, some general information about the Empress children. One of the main characters here is Solomon Demeter. He gives us a couple of interesting pointers. For example, Solomon Demeter refuses to utilize weapons and armor in combat that he himself has not worked on. Now, this makes sense, of course, it's an Empress children. Of course, he would make sure that his gear is as perfect as he can make it, but for some reason, I was always kind of thinking that that would be a little bit too dirty a work for the pristine Empress children, but apparently not. Oh, and by the way, the need for said weapon and armor is rather pressing at the moment, as the Empress children have found themselves embroiled in a protracted campaign against a Xeno species known as the Leer, snake-like monstrous creatures with all kinds of augmentation, both mechanical and uh, biological. The Lair inhabit several worlds, the biggest and currently most interesting one is covered by ocean, where the Lair live upon giant flying atolls, which is rather interesting. Flying islands, that is some serious technology right there. In addition, of course, to underwater cities. They were not fond of the Emperor's children, in fact, they outright attacked the Empire's expeditionary ships the moment they met them, and that is why the Emperor's children are now busy murdering every single last one of them. We also get a good grip of the chronology right off the bat, which is unusual. This is right after departing the Great Triumph at Ulanor, where the War Master was finally made, well, War Master. We also get an interesting piece of information. So, the Emperor's children, before they were reunited with Fulgrim, were on the verge of being destroyed, only about 200 brothers left. They rebuilt their legion using the gene code taken from Fulgrim, which arrived just in the nick of time, and after that, Fulgrim became known as the Phoenician, a clear reference to the Phoenix, rising from the ashes and all that. They also spent a great deal of time fighting underneath the aegis of the War Master, cooperating with the Lunar Wolves as a subsidiary force whilst they gained the strength and the numbers required to operate on their own. Interestingly enough, it might just be this cooperation that uh, sowed the seeds of what was to become a rather unfortunate streak of arrogance amongst the Emperor's children, as they received a great deal of praise from the War Master and the Lunar Wolves. The War Master himself described the Emperor's children as the finest legion he had ever fought alongside. Now, I'm not going to blame the Lunar Wolves for all of this, obviously, that'd be a bit unfair, but before this, the Emperor's children were famed for their skill at diplomacy, for being able to talk to people, being able to understand their position, and eventually arrive at a compromise. In other words, the exact opposite of what the Emperor's Children Legion eventually became. How much of this was due to the War Master's praise and their somewhat inflated sense of self, you know, how do I put this? I, I know. Imagine this. Your Legion, your fighting force, your history, all of it is about to get destroyed. There is no way out. You pretty much reconcile yourself with your fate. You're dead. Your heritage is dead, everything you've ever fought for is dead, all of it was in vain because the Legion has been cursed. The gene stock has been destroyed and you're seemingly just screwed. Then, as if the hand of fate itself reaches down and intervenes, Fulgrim is discovered at the absolute 11th hour, and the Legion rises from the ashes of certain annihilation to being one of the best Legions in the Imperium, praised by the War Master himself, and allowed as the only Legion to wear the Emperor's Aquila. It would be a small wonder if the members of the Legion figured that they might be special, chosen by fate, you know, just, uh, just a cut above the rest. And it certainly showed in some small subtle ways here and there, but in other cases, <laughs> rather, uh, rather obvious ways. 
the flagship of the Emperor's children, the Pride of the Emperor, a massive and beautiful vessel, had been crafted to what could only be considered full-on artistically anal specifications, and had taken twice as long to complete as any vessel of equal size. Oh, and by the way, there's also a mention in the book about a a mural showing Fulgrim receiving the Imperial Eagle, the Aquila. Then again, I don't think there was any specific mention that the Palantina Aquila incident happened before Fulgrim. I just remember that there was no specific mention of Fulgrim at the time, so you know, even then it could be incorrect, but I'm pretty damn sure that the Emperor handed the Aquila, the Palantine Aquila, the symbol of Ossus that was used at the ceremony, to an Emperor's children. Just a legionary, not Fulgrim. Again, this could be nothing, this could simply just be, as I mentioned, a representation of the act, using Fulgrim to symbolize the legion. On the other hand, there is a tiny little voice whispering in the back of my head that maybe, just maybe, Fulgrim didn't particularly like the idea that one of the Legion's most honorable moments happened without him. And so he might have decided to uh, photoshop history just a little bit. Oh, and by the way, allow me to clarify this just a little bit because I've seen some confusion around this. Other legions were allowed to use the Aquila as insignia. For example, you could have the Aquila on a medal or on your shoulder pad or in your greaves, stuff like that, painted on. But the Emperor's children were the only ones that were allowed to wear it proudly on their chest plate, and they were allowed to wear it all across the legion, regardless of achievement. Basically, any Emperor's children legionary was allowed to wear the Aquila whilst in other legions it was a sign of status. For example, Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow has a massive eagle on his chest plate. That was a sign of honor, whilst in the Emperor's Children, that was just allowed for anybody to wear. This obviously rather buttered up their already somewhat inflating ego. Another really interesting thing that has to do with the whole ego thing, which you're going to be hearing that quite a lot during this video, you know how I've said the Rembrandts weren't really welcome pretty much anywhere and, you know, outright avoided and hated in many legions, but the Emperor's Children were one of very few legions that welcomed them with open arms, and it was definitely the single legion that gave them the most access to its various inner workings, even going so far as to invite Remembrances in to their more private and quote-unquote holy ceremonies. Now, obviously, the Imperium at this point was a secular empire. They didn't have any you know, religious ceremonies, but as we previously mentioned, the Legioni Societies did have their fair share of traditions, and many legionaries considered these traditions to be for them, for the Legion, not for outsiders or mortals. A beautiful example of this, I think it was um, Garvia Loken that said, in relation to the great ceremony on Ulanor, that it was a private affair, not for outsiders. And bear in mind, the triumph at Ulanor had tens of thousands of Astartes and hundreds of thousands of army troops, and yet this was considered a private affair. The reason for that was because it was the Martial Brotherhood. The Imperial Army was tolerated because, you know, they were part of the Martial Brotherhood, but even then they were kept on the the outside, so to say. They were allowed to march in front of the Emperor, but they were a sideshow to the Legionis Astartes. Basically, the various legions put a great deal of value on their traditions and their rituals, and so the fact that the Emperor's children gave remembrances outsiders, outsiders of the worst sort too, non-fighters, poets, minstrels, and songwriters, that the fact that they gave these people, of all goddamn people, access to these inner workings and more sacred acts was, um, well, unprecedented. Hell, many of the legions even thought they were just a little bit crazy for doing so. <laughs> you can imagine Mortarion's reaction to something like this. I imagine words such as pretentious cuck and attention whore would be used rather frequently. Now, let's get back to the whole war against the lair thing. So, 
These snake-like thingity-bobs were uh, rather nasty little creatures. They all had in common a snake-like lower body, along with two pair of limbs, so four arms basically, and a snake-like head. They tended to bioengineer themselves quite a lot. Essentially, they would have a task within society that they would be bred to fulfill, and they would be given biomechanical enhancements to ensure that they would be able to fulfill that task to the best of their ability. They were also very, very technologically advanced, if the floating fucking islands didn't already give that away, because, you know, having an entire island literally fly is complicated and requires a fair bit of goddamn energy. Their ships were also very, very powerful. In fact, in the first naval engagement with the Imperium, they had completely wiped out the small scouting fleet with zero casualties of their own. They couldn't pull this shit off with a full-on Adeptus Astartes fleet, but nevertheless, the Imperium's ships are not bad, not in the slightest, and they're used to receiving a somewhat unfriendly reception, shall we say. So to be able to destroy a whole scouting fleet with zero casualties is rather impressive. In fact, their technology was so impressive that, and this is really interesting, there had apparently been talk about making them a protectorate state of the Imperium. That is rare. Generally speaking, the Imperium has two ways of dealing with aliens. Murder every last single one of them and burn the corpses, or two, ignore them until they can return and murder every single one of them and burn their corpses. To offer them protectorate status, especially to as Xenos species as this, was practically unheard of. There were also suggestions that they should simply be ignored because, well, it would require a substantial investment of military power. In fact, they expected it would take perhaps decades to subjugate the little bastards, and as such, it simply wouldn't be worth it. Better for the Imperium to return much later when they could bring to bear overwhelming military force. To Fulgrim, talk like this was like hanging a red flag in front of a bull. He decided that not only could he defeat the lair with only his legion, he could do it much, much faster. And he staked his very reputation on it. This is an interesting action. Now, on one hand, due to the simple fact that the Emperor's children consider themselves to be the absolute best, and to a certain extent, that is not entirely untrue they would be the right tool for the job. And they have a bit of an ego, Fulgrim most of all. As such, the idea of this really, really dangerous foe that everyone else is just saying like, no, 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 just, let's just steer away from those. It's not worth it. Taking on that enemy and defeating them quickly, well, that would certainly earn the Legion quite a lot of accolades. And that certainly seemed to be the case. Fulgrim made full use of the remembrances, ordering countless paintings, portraits, busts, and poems in honor of the victories being won over the lair. The victories, however, were not being bought cheaply, nor easily. At any given time, three-fourths of the entire legion was in combat against the lair. That is a lot of Legionis Astartes at any given time, and casualties were starting to get a wee bit uncomfortable. There is a conversation in the book referring to casualties of 10 and 11 men per engagement of the best companies, which means that, on average, we can probably assume that a company could expect somewhere between 10 to maybe 30 Battle Brothers lost per battle. Now that might not sound like a lot, but for Legion Warfare, that is actually a pretty goddamn significant rate of attrition. I remind you of Garviel Loken's attack upon the Siren Hold. He lost zero Battle Brothers during the assault upon an extremely heavily fortified position. Granted, occupied mostly by fanatics rather than full-on military troops, but still, the position had kept the Imperial Army completely checkmated for a very long time. The Legionis Astartes were more than happy to suffer wounds because, well, they could repair most of them. Not only, of course, are Legionis Astartes very, very tough little suckers, but the Imperium has grown 
very, very used to dealing with battlefield injuries. They've got a lot of practice in that particular field. So suffering between 10 to 30 casualties per engagement, that was pretty nasty. And again, this campaign was going to last for a fair bit of a while yet. In fact, it got so bad that some officers privately and very, very quietly, of course, suggested that maybe the Phoenician was being a bit too aggressive. The Legion had been given a bit more time to prepare and a bit more time to take this piecemeal. Casualties could be reduced, but due to the need to act so very, very quickly, they were taking casualties as bad as any in the history of the Legion in an extended campaign. But due to the excellent execution of the Emperor Children and the brilliant planning of Fulgrim, they were doing a hell of a lot better than anybody had actually imagined they would do. Again, the campaign was expected to take decades, and Fulgrim was just about to wrap it up after a very short period of time. There was one final meeting to be held before the final attack against the last remaining Lair Atoll was to be launched. A rather interesting meeting. And quite the interesting meeting it is. It turns out the Empress children had borrowed a couple other traditions from the Lunar Wolves, including their warrior lodgers. Although the Empress children were not fond of the idea of uh, informal fraternity between people of various ranks, and so their own warrior lodge, the Brotherhood of the Phoenix, was only open to men of substance and rank. Apparently, Captain and Up, which is a rather exclusive club. And it is in this club we meet a couple of old friends. Friends, quote-unquote, Saul, Tarvitz, and Lucius, who have just been promoted to the rank of Captains. It would appear that it wasn't just the foot soldiers dying down on the planet of Lair. The uh, upper echelons were not safe from the snake monsters either. Luckily, or well, as it turned out, perhaps not so luckily, Tarvitz and Lucius would not have to bother themselves with the snake monsters anymore. They were being sent off with Lord Commander Adolin to do a little patrol run and make sure that all of the loyal plans of the Imperium remain the loyal. As we already know, Lord Commander Adolin would decide that it would be better for him to wander off to a slightly different location, a certain planet with a bunch of mega arachnids on it, but hey, we've already gone over that particular line of events. Far more interesting is Fabius Bile and what he's up to. So, as I mentioned, the Lair were modifying their bodies, their psyches, all kinds of stuff, to help them towards perfection. Fabius Bile had been planning to maybe look into certain fields of research regarding perfection previously, but the lair had really sparked his imagination. He had brought aboard several specimens, both dead and alive, for his research. He had eventually brought the Lord Fulgrim down to his humble abode and introduced him to his ideas of starting experiments with the Emperor's gene seed using the casualties that had been suffered down on lair to see if he couldn't improve upon the Emperor's work. Whilst Fulgrim was at first a little bit hesitant, maintaining that the Emperor's work was already perfect, Fulgrim was swayed by the argument that, well, if the Emperor's work is perfect, then, you know, surely poking around a little bit here and there won't do any harm. It's not like Fabius is going to be destroying anything, he just wants to see if he can't maybe improve upon some of the Emperor's aspects here and there, you know, you never know. Maybe he gets lucky, maybe he doesn't, and really, what's the worst that can happen? He doesn't find anything? Well, you know, we'll just sweep the entire thing under the rug and that'll be that. Might as well give it a shot. This decision would of course turn out to be, um, rather, rather problematic in the long run. And it would also seem that it was driven mostly by ego, once again. We get a little bit of an inner monologue from Fulgrim thinking about how proud his father would be when he realizes what his son had done, how he had improved upon his father's work. Well, I am sure that the Emperor, looking upon the Emperor's children later on, would be, um, lost for words, no doubt. I'm not sure pride would be the correct word. 
interestingly enough, we've also got um, a rather odd event here. So, full group kind of fucks up the final attack. Not badly, mind you, but he massively overextends. He doesn't manage to bring up his forces in time to support him as he strikes towards the heart of the Lair Capital. This is an unusually amateurish mistake for Fulgrim and the Emperor's children. I wonder why. It just, it seems so... out of place, I guess? I mean, up until this point, Fulgrim has been running a flawless campaign, subjugating a, an entire species that the Imperium figured would take decades and massive amounts of military force to beat, and yet now he blunders at the very end? Huh. Odd? I don't really have a whole lot more insight into it. I mean, I, maybe he could be distracted by the idea of making Daddy proud with his ubermensch, I guess, but it doesn't really seem like enough. Maybe the high casualty figures are making him doubt himself a little bit. Was it really correct of me to push this hard, maybe? But it doesn't quite fit, really, so I'm not entirely sure, honestly. However, he does find himself something very, very interesting, a snake orgy temple. Those were words I never thought I'd speak, but here we are, snake orgy temple. The lair in the middle of their nice little capital has a big old coral reef inside of which they writhe around each other, fucking happily whilst being out of their minds on narcotics. A suitably disturbing or erotic, depending on your fetishes, I suppose, sight, but more importantly, there is a statue of a bull-headed humanoid with several arms in the middle of the temple. This is quite clearly a statue representation of a Keeper of Secret, a Slaneshi Greater Demon. And in the middle of all of this, a silver sabre. The uh, soon-to-be rather infamous Lair Sword, which Fulgrim is immediately drawn to. He feels he needs to pick it up and wield it. The moment he does, he's feeling like something's really, really wrong about this sword, but it seems as if that impression fades away immediately upon picking it up. The sword, of course, as we've... Uh, we all know now, is not a normal sword. In fact, it has a little bit of a demon inside of it. Yes, yes. One of those whisper into your ear and make you do stupid shit kind of demons. The worst kind, really. And it's gotta be a damn persuasive demon as well, considering it will eventually have Fulgrim wearing full makeup and dressing up in drag. More about that later. And this essentially ends the campaign against the lair with the good old-fashioned annihilation of yet another creepy little alien species. Now, the whole temple thing, I, I gotta admit, I'm a little bit like, okay, so Fulgrim sees a sword, a nice sword, don't get me wrong, in the middle of a temple full of orgy snakes fucking each other while bummed out of their minds and all manners of narcotics, and his first reaction is to go and pick up the sword. Alright, now, I can kind of see the rationale for it, because the Emperor's children are hardcore interested in alien weaponry, in fact, this is a little bit of the reason why they probably got corrupted in the first place, and probably why the sword looks like a sword. This whole thing was obviously a part of a very large and long-standing chaos plan, and undoubtedly they could have made the object look like anything, a pendulum, a giant dildo, who knows, but they chose a sword. And part of the reason for this is that the Emperor children are very fond of weapons. They have a nasty habit of culturally appropriating the weapons of vanquished Xeno species. Now, this is a little bit difficult to explain, but I'll try my best. Basically, when the Emperor's children see a different Xeno species do something better than them, like, for example, let's say they're really, really good with barbed maces, yeah? So the Emperor's children are like, wow, that's, that's impressive. I bet I could do that. They will then adopt the weapon and the fighting style, and they will continue using both of them until they have gotten so good that they are even better than the race they took them from. And this is, of course, again, their constant search for perfection. If they see anybody that's better than them, they have to upstage them. They even do this to other legions. They might take a favoured tactic of the Iron Warriors, for example, adapt it to their own fighting style, improve upon it, and then basically go like, haha, look, 
We've made this better. Aren't we just the bestest best legion to have ever bested the best things? As you can probably imagine, this does make the Emperor's children absolutely insufferable twats. Just like somebody who would run random ads in the middle of his videos. You know, I feel I'm getting pretty good at these segues. Anyways, yes, the Emperor's children are very fond of weapons, so... Again, I can kind of see why Fulgrim would do this. Not like he understands anything about demons, anyways, or... Well, he does understand something, but he doesn't get the idea of, like, demonic weapons. And even if he did, he's Fulgrim. He'd probably just think that, oh, it's a demon in the weapon, I can surely outwit a simple demon. But judging by how he reacts to the fact that the sword starts talking to him... No, he doesn't know anything about demon-infested weapons yet. With all that being said, though, it's still a sword in the middle of a demonic snake monster orgy tent. At least put on a glove or something, I guess. I mean, you don't know where that thing's been, or what's been rubbing up against it. But hey, I'm sure nothing bad will come from picking up the magical sword in the orgy pit. Absolutely nothing. <sighs> oh, well. Not like something bad hadn't already happened, the campaign against the Lair had been rather costly. Some of the more pessimistic estimates suggested that maybe upwards of 700 legionaries were dead, and maybe as much as 4,500 wounded. This was a hefty price to pay, to put it very mildly, and especially considering how relatively brief the campaign had been. The rate of attrition was quite nasty, in fact, it might even be comparable to the rate of attrition we were going to see later on during the heresy itself, which sure as hell says something. There is certainly an argument to be made here that, one, the campaign could only have been completed this quickly and this relatively cheaply due to the expertise, skill, and planning of the Thousand Sons. On the other hand, a argument could also most definitively be made that the casualties would probably have been a hell of a lot lighter if the campaign hadn't been executed with quite this level of aggression. A level of aggression only made necessary by the boasts that Fulgrim had made before the campaign started. It is beyond all doubt that the Emperor's children are very, very good at what they do, but... It's also quite clear that their hubris could cost them quite dearly. And there was little rest for the weary, as Fulgrim's brother, Ferus Manus, requested his aid in dealing with a rather odd foe. Apparently, a bunch of old Terran colonists, long, long, long before the Crusade, in fact, back in the Golden Age of expansion and uh, science, had, um, well, they'd kept their ships ticking, somehow for literally millennia, and over the course of said millennia, they'd picked up a rather unfortunate habit of, um, integrating Xeno species into their fleet. Something that you can probably imagine the Imperium was not particularly fun to hear. And to begin with, though, the meetings with this group, the Diasporax, were relatively peaceful, with the Iron Hands seeing that they were humans and therefore thinking, oh cool, brothers. And then they figured out that they had aliens in their fleet, which uh, changed the definition of brother into target. Sadly, the Iron Hands have never really been masters of fleet combat. Don't get me wrong, they're not bad at it, but they tend towards somewhat um, inflexible thinking, which is a bit of a problem when you're fighting in a 3D plane. As such, they were really having some problems dealing with the Diasporax, which were of course expert fleet fighters, seeing as well... They literally lived and breathed every day on their life on a spaceship. They'd gotten pretty good at running them at this point, and this wasn't the first time somebody had tried to murder all of them and scatter them to space dust. This is why Ferus asked for the aid of the Emperor's children. He figured that the only way to really deal with them was to, <laughs> rather iron-handedly of them, just throw a giant fucking net over the entire sector and then slowly squeeze until there was nowhere left to run. Which, that sounds like Ferris Mun is alright, no doubt there. The Iron Hands are, like I said, somewhat inflexible and somewhat brutish in their solutions. They're the kind of people that fish with dynamite. 
the types that utilize brute strength over, well, literally everything else. Despite all of this, Ferris, Manus, and Fulgrim were actually really good friends, which did come as a bit of surprise. I mean, Fulgrim, a lover of art and everything fanciful, and Ferris Manus, hater of everything fanciful. <laughs> They've um, got some differences when it comes to their hobbies, but the story of their friendship, which is told in the book, they met on Terra before the Great Crusade and decided to challenge one another to a friendly little competition about who could make the best weapon. Ferris Manus made a sword, which surprises me a bit, he doesn't really strike me as the sword type, and Fulgrim made a hammer, which also surprises me a bit as he doesn't really strike me as the hammer type either. And upon seeing each other's weapons, both immediately exclaimed that the other's weapon was the superior one. So they essentially agreed to have an unofficial draw and swapped weapons. I gotta admit, I feel this is a little bit contrived, so... Fulgrim made a hammer, and Ferris Manus made a sword. Now, I can definitely see Fulgrim with a sword, and I can definitely see Ferris with a hammer, but for them to just kind of make the other's type of weapon and then switch? Yeah, it's a heartwarming tale, but feels a little forced. I much prefer the second story, so apparently Sanguinius had brought a ton of statues to the Imperial Palace to give as a gift to the Emperor. Upon seeing them, Fulgrim of course wet his panties and gushed all over them, while Ferris Manus said something about art being useless and only for pansy faggots. To which apparently Fulgrim responded, You're such a gorgon. If you can't appreciate beauty, how will you appreciate the galaxy we are going to conquer? And apparently the nickname, The Gorgon, stuck, because Ferris quite liked it. Now that, I like way more, because I could definitely see Ferris Manus, of all people, taking to the nickname The Gorgon. It really fits him. At the same time, I can also definitely see Fulgrim throwing a little bit of a needle towards one of his brothers. Not necessarily with any kind of malice, but, well, let's just say that some of his more thin-skinned brothers wouldn't have gotten the joke. Ferris Manus, however, well, <laughs> he took it straight up and indeed wore it as a badge of honor. I really like that story because it fits both of their characters really, really well. That aside, let's return to the whole fleet battle thing. So, Ferris had spent a great deal of time trying to catch something he couldn't catch. His answer was to bring in more people so that he could again try to catch the thing that he can't catch. Fulgrim, on the other hand, presented a somewhat more workable solution to the conundrum. After all, if you cannot catch something, then expending even more energy trying to catch the thing you can't catch seems rather pointless. However, clearly the Diasporex had a reason for staying in system. I mean, they were being hunted by the Iron Hands, who clearly wanted to wear their hides as raincoats. Clearly, if they had any sense, they'd be leaving, so there must be a reason why they're still here. Fulgrim surmised that seeing as the fleet of the Diasporax was rather massive, they must be looking for something relating to the fleet. And since they haven't been found attacking nearby systems for food or water or anything, the only real option then would be fuel. Which makes everything a hell of a lot more simple. Threaten the fuel producing facilities and the enemy fleet will have to stand and fight to protect them or run out of fuel and simply just die slowly. Either way, the Imperium is happy. And considering the system in question didn't have anything like massive deposits of Prometheum or other fuel sources, the only way they could be getting said fuel was solar collectors hidden within the corona of nearby stars. This still meant that the Imperium would have to cover a fairly significant portion of space to find the bloody things, but it would be a hell of a lot easier than finding single spaceships in the vast emptiness of space. And so the fleet began looking for the solar collectors. In the meantime, however, we have a couple more interesting revelations. There's a conversation between Ferris, Manus, and Fulgrim, for example, where Ferris not only states that he was entirely fine with Horus taking the mantle of Warmaster, he was actually happy it wasn't him because, well... He had enough responsibility as it was, and certainly didn't want anything else. We also hear that certain Primarchs, Angron and Mortarion for example, were not particularly fond of Horus's elevation, but... Well, 
not particularly surprising that. But we also get a few glimpses of the demon starting to fuck with Fulgrim's head. Uh, urging him to goad Ferris Manas, for example, which is rather interesting. Now, of course, this might just be a demon being a douchebag, natural form of demonhood, but at the same time, the demons have already kind of made up their little mind about their plan, and it would appear that at least part of their plan was originally to try and turn Ferris Manas over to the bad guy side, and yet here they are encouraging Fulgrim to piss on him. Interesting. I suspect that part of the reason is it's very easy to see this chaos plan as one great big plan and amalgamation of all of the chaos powers working together because, well, they are facing annihilation if they do not, but on the other hand, chaos is of course naturally a rather fractured alliance, even at the best of times, so it stands to reason that certain powers within this alliance, quote-unquote, might have their very own reasons for screwing around a little bit, and indeed, we're going to be seeing some pretty clear evidence of that in later books, and it looks like maybe Sanesh has his own little plans for Fulgrim. Not particularly surprising, considering his eventual fate, but still an interesting little tidbit. Also, I, again, this is one of those things. So, Fulgrim looks at the sword and is like, well, it looks pretty, but the gem in which the demon rests looks a bit crude. and maybe I should have that replaced, and instantly he dismisses the thought. I am, again, kind of surprised. Now, again, like I mentioned previously, at this point in time, Fulgrim doesn't really have any real understanding of the concept of a demon weapon, or how it could interact with his mind, but the sword seems to be fucking with him rather clearly. At one moment, Fulgrim's like, yeah, I'm definitely going to have the stone replaced, and then the next second, he's like, no, 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 that would be the most vile desecration. How the fuck does he not notice this? I'm wondering if I'm not giving Fulgrim enough credit, or if I'm giving him too much credit, because on one hand, if you don't understand the idea of something fucking with your head, naturally that wouldn't be your first, you know, thought. You'd just think like, well, you know, that's a little bit strange that I would think that, but then again, the brain does creepy things all the time. I mean, how many of us hasn't half asleep been doing something stupid, and then your brain catches you in it, like, you're about to put on your underpants and your brain goes like, oh, I'm gonna have to wipe my ass first. Best wipe my ass with my underpants. And then a quarter of a second later, you're like, no, that's a bad idea. Let's use toilet paper like normal people. So yeah, the brain can fuck with you a lot, but he's a Primarch. I can't help but expect that he would self-analyze a little bit. I mean, certain Primarchs like Gilliman, for example, and granted, the, the two are not comparable directly, but... Gilliman is capable of analyzing his own action from a third-person perspective. That is how he is able to write his great magnus opus, the Codex Astartes. He is capable of analyzing what he might do in a given situation, and then extrapolate the answers against that solution from himself. He's also capable of simulating the actions and thought pattern of a lesser commander and then extrapolating again from there. He is basically capable of simulating his own and other people's mind via a thought experiment. Now, again, that's Gilliman, and Fulgrim is certainly a bit more impulsive, to put it mildly, but he is still a Primarch, and should probably have some ability to do this, but Again, I'm wondering if I'm just being too hard on poor little Fulgrim here, honestly. Ah, fuck it. Let's instead move on to somebody you just simply can't be too harsh on. Fabius Bile, and this is a rather interesting one. So, a legionary was brought up from the Lair planet on the brink of death. Now, it's not clearly stated whether or not he could have been saved, or if he was beyond the help of the Apothecarium, but... Considering he was still alive after having been brought back up to orbit and into Fabius's care, it kind of suggests that maybe he wasn't completely screwed? And obviously, the implication there is that Fabius decided to experiment on somebody that could potentially have been saved. Now, later on, he will be making specific requests for living specimens, but it's clear from this that Fabius was never really entirely good in the brain department. He was probably always a bit cuckoo. He only required official sanction to truly start going crazy 
upon his brother legionaries. And the interesting part here is he figured out how to connect the brain's pain receptors with the brain's pleasure center, which is an interesting idea. This of course means that every time a legionary suffers pain, the sensation simply just bypasses the usual nerve receptacles that are about to tell you, ouch, that hurts, pull your hand away from the fire, and instead head straight towards the pleasure centers, which are far more likely to tell you, ooh, that's kinda cozy, keep sticking your hand in the fire. Now, the battlefield usages of this, um, discovery are rather self-explanatory, but it also gives us a couple more interesting little pieces of information. One, this means that if anybody receives this treatment, which, considering Fabius's interest in screwing around with people's heads, would in all due likelihood be most of them, and this practically guarantees their eventual fall to Slanesh. Secondly, it also explains why the Empress children went full-on pain-loving crazies before they were even fully corrupted. They simply had their noggins screwed with. But that was not Fabius's only, um, success. Seems like a strange word to use here, but I guess it fits. It also managed to distill a drug that had been extracted from the lair corpses. <laughs> Which, wowzers. We're now seeing the Emperor's Astartes being, um, enhanced with the blood and guts of Zeno's aliens. Whew, that is, uh, that's rather spicy, and again, somewhat surprisingly to me, Fulgrim okayed this without really much of a second thought, apparently, which... Uh, yeah. Okay, again, I get it, Fulgrim wants better Astartes, and I'm sure Fabius isn't telling him the whole truth, but... Wow, that is... Yeah. Fulgrim seems to be remarkably easy to convince. I mean, again... I just want to point out, once again, even though I've done this before, the Xenos are considered to be clearly inferior, vile monstrosities. The very thought of mixing these monstrous creatures together with the Empress Astartes should be, well, heretical, basically, and yet there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of pushback from Fulgrim about any of this. Granted, again, it could be the influence of the sword, but I mean, he hasn't had the thing for that long. I'm amazed at the rapidity of Fulgrim's fall. Anyways, this new drug would be opt-in only, which meant that only the legionaries that chose to receive it would actually be issued with the drug, but I mean, it came with their Primarch's recommendation. <laughs> Very few of them would go like, oh well, our Primarch says it's okay, must be heresy. <laughs> now, a fair few of them did figure that introducing an unknown substance to their bodies was not exactly kosher. A lot of them thought in exactly the way that I described. We are already perfect, so what possible need could we have of this new drug that nobody really knows where it come from, but on the other hand, again, it came with Fulgrim's approval, so clearly it couldn't be that bad. And again, to be fair, the drug was actually really, really good. It increased the strength and reflexes of the recipient quite considerably. There was a small you know, side effect early on that overloaded the target's heart and ended with them you know, dying, but details? That was mostly fixed by the time it was introduced into the Legion proper, so you know, it's fine, it's fine. Speaking of uh, untested chemicals and slight by effects, it would appear that the little lair temple had also had some effect on the mortals that had been allowed to see it as well. Previously in the book, several of the remembrances had been shuttled down to the lair temple to have a good long look at it, and it was going to produce some rather interesting effects. One of them was Serena De Angelus, a famous painter who was looking for just the right shade of red when she decided to start cutting herself and mixing the blood into the paint, and that would produce just the right color. Eventually, she would um, mix in far more interesting substances as well, like the blood and guts of others, and also excrements, because fuck it, why not? Whatever was in that temple was uh, clearly quite potent. Well, there was a statue of a keeper of secrets in the middle of the room, plus the orging snake, I guess, that would have a certain effect upon pretty much anybody, but the corruption sure was rather rapid with this one. Usually, you'd have to have an exposure to Chaos Corrupted Material for 
at least a while before people are going this crazy, but then again, none of these people even have the concept of being corrupted in the first place, so that undoubtedly makes them somewhat easier to corrupt. Though, interestingly enough, some of the various people down there will start to notice something. Julius Caesarian, for example, had had a rather, how should I say it, interesting experience with it. He described it as such. My every sense was stimulated. Since then, everything is grey and ashen to me. I take no joy in the things that once set my soul afire. I walk the halls of this ship, halls that are filled with the works of the greatest artists in the Imperium, and I feel nothing. Now, of course, for us, it's pretty obvious to see exactly what is riding poor little Julius, but uh, for them, he didn't know, and he couldn't really find any answers either. The closest he got was some long-dead Terran scholar from the pre-unification era that had written something resembling this, or at the very least the relativity of morality, which is an interesting way to think about Slanesh. Granted, if you hold to the belief that nothing is intrinsically moral or immoral, then the teachings of Slanesh is not in and of themselves any worse than anything else, but in a logical universe where certain things are kosher and certain things are not, like, for example, murdering someone purely for the pleasure of hearing them scream, well, the simple fact is, morality is definitely subjective to a certain extent, but within a civilized society, there are morals. And within any kind of structure in society, there has to be morals. At the very least, the basic foundations, such as you shouldn't kill people, because it's going to make keeping a society stable rather difficult. Oh, and speaking of stability, Fulgrim has finally realized that he might be going a little bit fucking cuckoo as he started to hearing voices in his head. And I mean this in the most literal term as possible, as in a different person speaking in his head, giving him thoughts that Fulgrim would normally not have considered. For example, Ferris Manus has rushed off to fight the Diasporax after they had fallen for Fulgrim's trap, whilst not coordinating with Fulgrim, something Fulgrim is not particularly fond of, whilst the voice in his head is trying to goad him to view this as his brother's betrayal, rather than simply just a compulsive act of Ferris Manus, and to be fair, it is Ferris Manus we're talking about here. It's not exactly his style to simply just sit by and wait for aid, is it? Hell, Fulgrim even realized this and for a while thought that he was going slowly insane due to some kind of effect from the Lair Temple, but eventually he dismissed this thought because, well, what could lay low such a perfect being as himself? Interesting this, he was on the right track, but then he dismissed it due to hubris. I wonder if this is the reason why Fulgrim is so easy to manipulate. As I mentioned, any Primarch would be able to notice that they are clearly being manipulated, but in the case of Fulgrim, he might simply just dismiss the entire notion of being manipulated because he is Fulgrim, he is the Emperor's perfect being, therefore he couldn't possibly be manipulated. And to a certain degree, this definitely does make sense, as we saw with the offering of the Palantina Aquila, where Fulgrim decided to insert himself, he clearly has got a bit of an ego, as we saw with the conquest of the Lair as well, where he was willing to sacrifice a rather substantial number of his legionaries for his own pride, essentially, and of course his acceptance of Fabius Bile's rather vile tests. He clearly is willing to sacrifice quite a lot upon the altar of perfection. Now, of course, the idea of obtaining perfection is in and of itself lunacy, because you can't ever reach perfection. By its very definition, perfection is inobtainable for any normal living creature. Now, my main problem with this is, he is still a Primarch. This is clearly a part of his psyche, and as such it definitely would be able to override a rather considerable part of it, but would he really be this vulnerable? Would not the clinical part of his mind rise up and rile against this clearly rather insane thought that a voice is speaking in his mind thoughts that he could not possibly have? Eventually, he rationalizes this away 
as this being a voice of his subconscious, which again... <sighs> I'm kind of conflicted by this. On one hand, I can kind of buy and understand the excuse that Fulgrim would be conceited enough to rationalize this away as having access to his subconscious, which, you know, that would be a step towards perfection. As Fulgrim himself says, who else could claim to have such an honest counselor as one's own mind, but at the same time, this all seems a little bit too obvious. One possible explanation, though, that I quite like is the idea that Fulgrim has rationalized this away not purely due to his own mind. He hasn't, purely based upon the fact that he's hearing voices, rationalized himself to the idea that this is his subconscious. Instead, he thinks, okay, there are many other people that were down in the temple. In fact, even mere mortals were brought down. Bekua Kinska, a famous composer, took recordings of the quote-unquote music within the Lair Temple, and she doesn't seem to have gone insane. Nobody else seems to be talking about voices in their heads, which would suggest that the only one going insane would be Fulgrim. And that is a thought that I would entirely understand his mind railing against, because again, Fulgrim views himself as the very embodiment of the Emperor's children's pursuit of perfection. If he's going insane and nobody else is, that would mean by definition that he is not perfect. And that can't possibly be true. He, Fulgrim, can't possibly be more flawed than a mere mortal. That would be ludicrous. And of course, we know now that Kinska was going quite batty herself, but he did not know this at the moment. And even if he did know, the voice in his head would undoubtedly help him rationalize away their insanity as rationality. And I think that is a rather fitting conclusion to end the first video on the Fulgrim book series on. The fact that, yes, this kind of doesn't make too much sense. As a Primarch, he should be able to know better, but at the same time, if you take into consideration his conceit, his idea of himself as a superior being, he simply can't accept the idea that he, and he alone, is going insane, because that would go against everything he would consider to be rational. He has essentially, rather amazingly, rationalized himself into insanity, which is quite the feat. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon in part two. Until then, have a good day.